This is Rachel Chateau with Pride.com, and today I'm speaking with Brian Fuller and Steakhouse, director and producers of Shudder's new documentary series, Queer for Fear. Good morning, Brian. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I'm so excited to talk about this series. I have been waiting to get my eyeballs on it ever since it was announced. I was a huge fan of horror noir. And as soon as that happened, I was like, God, I hope they do one on queer horror. And lo and behold, here it is. It has landed. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about how it came together on your end? Uh, you know, well, this project started, uh, one of the producers on Horror Noir, which is an amazing documentary and really kind of the uh, progenitor of, of this documentary. And so Phil Noble, who is the editor of Fangoria magazine, he produced Horror Noir along with like Ashley and Tanana Reeve. And so it was all his doing because he he did it for one marginalized community and wanted to do it for another marginalized community as a straight ally. And uh, so the project took on many different shapes uh, from its inception, like horror noir. It was supposed to be a movie, uh, mm-hmm. as a 90 minute movie. Um, and as uh, so they did a version of that and it felt like there was just so much material to cover that it's like roller skating through the Louvre <laughs> and, and it just it was vast and so uh, it, I saw that version and started talking about like okay what really is this series and what is the right format for this series with Shudder and because there is so much history and there are so many letters in the LGBTQ mm-hmm. alphabet, it, it felt like it couldn't all be contained to to one ninety minute expression. And so then we talked about it being a uh, a four hour series. And first we asked for six, and they said <laughs> we can do four, and okay, great. And then we tried to squeeze everything into four. And what we found is that, once again, we were going to be roller skating through the Louvre. And even with four hours, it's still not enough time to tell an emotional story about Mm -hmm. people's lives and certain thematics that resonate uh, for queer audiences in horror films. So what we have now with the show is a four hour first season and in success there will be more because we have enough material for at least three seasons we interviewed over a hundred people we have hundreds and hundreds of hours of interview footage spanning uh, you know gothic literature to uh, yellow jackets and so we we're faced with the choice of how do we condense this material and essentially what sort of bubbled up in you know early drafts of of this project like Oz Perkins had two lines and it was like we we just have to stop and tell stories we can't yeah. just rush through things and just and one of those lines was Anthony Perkins was my fault <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. you know what we have to build out room to really tell these stories yes. and so What you get in this first season of Queer for Fear is the first couple of episodes are kind of foundational biographies of queer storytellers and, you know, people who are interested in queer storylines. And then as we get into episodes three and four, it starts to explore the thematics of queerness and horror, whether it's transformation stories or being the alien amongst us, those types of things that have certain cultural and historical correlations to conversion therapy, the awareness of the Kinsey scale and Kinsey sexual studies, and also the popularization of Freudian and Jungian psychology, how those affected uh, horror movie storytelling. And so it just felt like, it's, it's almost a, a foundational poo-poo platter of queer history with regard to horror. And there's so much more to tell because we kind of work our way up to 
uh, the 50s and 60s and a, a little bit of the 80s as some of those thematics from the 40s, 50s and 60s are drawn through to modern storytelling mm -hmm. or modern for me, uh, because that was my childhood, the 80s. And uh, so we have so much more to tell. So if people enjoy this, subscribe to Shutter, tell your friends and there'll be more queer for fear. And if you don't, there won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly hope people do because I mean, I am a huge horror buff. I like horror is part of my personality. And I still feel like I learned so much watching this things that I didn't know. Uh, okay. I you know I, I didn't know about the Bram Stoker Walt Whitman letters. There were things here that I was just like really surprised by and delighted to learn okay. for you. Were there things that you, what, what was something maybe that you learned that surprised you in the process of making this? All of it. Like I had no idea <laughs> that Mary Shelley was queer. I had no idea that Bram Stoker was queer. I remember explicitly, you know, in seventh grade, uh, after reading Dracula and sort of, you know, picking up on things in a certain level of 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 horniness, you know, with <laughs> dynamics in Dracula, uh -huh. that I was like, Ooh, what's what's this about? And looked up Bram Stoker and he was married with kids, and I was like, oh, never mind. Uh, but then, you know, thanks to David Skull, uh, who's a uh, you know, Dracula historian, he unearthed these these letters and a whole history that is below the surface and really kind of changes the perception of Dracula as 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 you know, about queer oppression, about self-suppression, about the fear of lust, about the fear of sexuality. And it's kind of like puritanical core written by a deeply, deeply closeted queer man. And mm -hmm. that changes everything with how we look at Dracula and what Dracula actually means. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and I know that I definitely put my queer tinfoil hat on sometimes and I see it everywhere, but what I think I really, what comes across in this is like that tinfoil is hat is just a hat. Like queerness has always been present in the genre, like literally from its inception as a genre. Um, yeah. And I think in a, you know, our, our histories are often erased or sometimes literally burned. So do you kind of see this film as one of the ways that we are in, you know, an antidote to that, to being like, we are here, we're here, always were here um, with this film. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that there is something about queer people taking ownership over a genre that is often, at least in pop culture, sort of uh, horror broad uh, to exclusion and uh, in a fashion that I think, you know, we've, we've, frequently seen ourselves either as victims or poorly represented characters in the horror genre. But if we look deeper, we are represented and they're fascinating represented representations. Mm -hmm. And they're also authentic and honest because people like Bram Stoker have really complicated relationships with their sexuality. Mm -hmm. and, and so if anything, uh, the purpose of this is to provide community for queers and horror and and to sort of say like you you own this genre what's exciting is to claim ownership of that and to get a little rowdy as Nate Beaver <laughs> one of our producers would say with our our passion for horror and and kind of looking at like you, you know we have a lot of these horror bros on online who are saying you know horror is now ruined because it's, it's 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 woke and it's like well it's always been woke and it's always been about something you just yeah, what movies are you watching <laughs> well, what experience have you been living that it is so narrow that you cannot see what's right in front of your face and as queer people we've been forced to see what look beyond what's in front of our face for a deeper meaning and a deeper relationship with community. And I think, you know, queer people need community of a wide variety of sorts. I personally think, you know, the like queer communities are also very complicated and also not necessarily welcoming for, mm -hmm. for folks who don't meet certain kind of body types or, you know, whatever kind of uh, demographic, like, 
queer cultures tend to demographic uh, mm -hmm. very insularly. And this is a way to sort of open up that if you're queer and you like horror, you're in a bigger community than your CrossFit group. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. And I do think that like horror community is a thing and a queer horror community is like a really great subset of that um, because we're the outsiders of the outsiders, you know? So <laughs> we find our tribe and uh, the other weirdos. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, we had a great conversation um, with Amy Steele who played Jenny Field in Friday the 13th part two and is perhaps uh, the most iconic of the Friday the 13th final girls. And she put it, Really interestingly, uh, in our conversation, she talked about how when she goes to these horror conventions and she signs all of these autographs and and there are a lot of 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 people, but she the queer fans stand out because mm -hmm. a, a lot of the folks that that come and want her autograph want to stand next to her because you know she's sort of uh, you know, they fetishize her relationship to Jason in some way, but it is kind of about Jason, whereas the queer fans come and it's mm. about fetishizing her as a survival of her a survivor of her narrative. And if mm -hmm. she can survive her narrative, queer people can survive their narrative. And that's right. the, the kind of aspirational, inspirational aspects of final girls, whether they're queer or not, that provide to queer communities. Right. Survival stories. Like we connect with survival stories. And I think that is a big part of why horror and queerness go so well together. Um, and now you also have made iconic series, you know, that people love. And do you, I would love to see where you see yourself sort of in the legacy of like a James Whale where, you know, he kept, had to keep things very coded, very subtextual, whereas you're able to kind of push that to the forefront more so. Um, I, I, do you, when, as you were watching this, were you reflecting on kind of where your place in the genre is, you know, in the spectrum and history? You know, not necessarily because, it, like, I, uh, I, I'm a horror fan probably first. The then I am a storyteller, so I wasn't, and it, it never crossed my mind to compare myself with James Whale. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that, that comparison, but. Um, I, I think there's it's it's hard to compare yourself to somebody who is as pioneering as James Whale. And when you look right. at something like Bride of Frankenstein and how it's one of the queerest, I mean, Old Dark House is, is probably his queerest expression, uh, but Bride of Frankenstein would be next. And that was under the oppression of, of the Hays Codes. Yeah. So he's got a lot out there and a yeah. really sneaky way and that's one of the other kind of glorious things about genre storytelling is that the 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 metaphor can occlude uh certain points of view that would want to oppress queer storylines but it slips right by them like it, it, without uh being picked up on if it's a monster and mm -hmm you know, from a queer point of view, we are monsters. So there's something about that that feels uh, prideful. Okay, that's fair. I'm going to say that I can draw a very clear okay. line. <laughs> but I, will, I will take it on um, between something like Bride of Frankenstein um, and Hannibal, obviously, because there's I mean, Hannibal is so queer coded and you, you short of saying, let's have sex. It is so, so, so wonderfully, wonderfully queer. Um, I guess I want to know from you, I mean, obviously the Hayes Code doesn't exist and you did stay in that place of not overtly saying it. Do you think that some of that is influenced by your history of watching these series or, or these uh, films, or is it that there is some pressure to keep things subtextual to this day that is the legacy of things like the Heritage Quote Code. And I have to ask, because I'm contractually, as a horror fan, have to ask, 
what are the odds we're going to see a fourth season of Hannibal? <laughs> I need yeah, it to I, come back. <laughs> I, I do too, and so does Maz, and so does Hugh, and, uh, you know, Caroline and Katie, and there's there's so much fun to be had. Uh, we just have to have somebody that's interested in doing it. You know, that's that's the thing. So uh, absolutely, everybody still wants to do it, and you know, never say never, like there's, there's opportunities that I can't discuss publicly yet, uh, about things that like, it, it doesn't, we shouldn't worry about time running out because as long as, as folks are, are interested, I think everybody's interested. You just pick up the story wherever the time allows us to re-enter the story. Um, so I think we're all still kind of thinking like, well, like they'll wake up one day and somebody will, will pick it up. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so we're being patient until then. And uh, I think for, you know, for me as a storyteller, one of the things I love about this documentary and this era is sort of the decodering aspect of interpreting queer codes as opposed to having them lay out so explicitly. And maybe it's a, a factor of my age, but I kind of like the code. I think there's fun in, I like the poetry of the code. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, on one point of view, it is about suppression and oppression and, and preventing, you know, these conversations from, from entering the mainstream. But on the other hand, I love interpreting a poem. I love, you know, like Batter My Heart Three Person God by John Donne is this wonderful poem that when you break it apart and go like, oh my God, this is all about this queer man's struggle with his sexuality and his relationship to his religion. And it's in there, but you have to dig it out. So you have to work for it a little bit. And I don't mind that work. I think it's very exciting mm -hmm. as an audience member to work for that. We're in a different space socially, politically, with all of those things. So explicit representation is important. Um, and also that's kind of a product of sort of queer mainstream culture I've never really seen myself in. Uh, th for whatever reason, like I like I remember showing up for the uh, um, the the gay club at college when I was like, I'm gonna go to the gay club and I went there. And it was all like white jocks. And I was like, I don't belong here either. Oh, so, and I think yeah. that's a common queer experience for people who are othered in ways that the othered others are not othered and <laughs> therefore don't have uh, the access to, to, to whatever socialization that may be afforded to people who fit certain demographics. And I think that's very relatable for queer people, but what's always relatable to queer people is the survival story. And that's where we go to queer horror. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's amazing. Um, I want to thank you again for taking the time to chat with me today. I can't tell you enough how much I loved Queer for Fear. I, I'm really rooting for all three seasons. We need the trilogy. Um, and I'm excited for people to see it. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for supporting the show. Of course, of course. Shudder has such a great reputation after horror noir and cursed films for making like really incredible horror documentaries. And uh, and so I would love to know how this came together. How did how did it get started? Well, Shudder wanted an, an unofficial follow up to horror noir. And so this is this became that <laughs> it took it, it, it initially started off as a doc and then it just kind of snowballed into this series because there's too much media to cover and it just the topic is so broad and there's so many different people to talk about it and different reactions and thoughts that honestly it could be a 10 10 part series um <laughs> i would watch what it <laughs> we're, what we're covering in this series is really the beginnings you know it's 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 all of the beginnings up to and, but I mean, Gal, to get to Dangerous Woman of the '90s, but you know, we don't cover all of the '80s and the '90s and all that stuff. And so, I'm hoping that everyone watches this 
And then if everyone watches it, we get to make more. <laughs> oh, that was my next question. I, is there a chance for a sequel? Because we, I would love to, I would yeah. love to see more. I think right now we're just trying to finish this one and then we can figure out what's next. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So, one of the things that I really appreciated about it is how it shows how intrinsic queerness is to the literal beginning of the horror genre. And so often they try to erase our narratives and write us out of the story, but we wrote the story in this yes. case. So um, do you kind of see this documentary as an antidote to that? Yeah, I feel like this documentary is for everyone who's kind of wondering anything about horror, even not even queer horror, just horror, because there's yeah. so much in there. And you're right, we developed this genre. Mary Shelley, Bram Stoker, Oscar Wilde, they exploded it you know i mean it's like and and you know there's we we talk about these letters in the show of you know that mary shelley wrote and bram stoker wrote it's like okay maybe they weren't out as huge queers on the scene but there's no getting around that they were dabbling in something here <laughs> um, was it towsy so, mousy <laughs> yes towsy mousy or you know i want to read your letters with my door locked late at night you know uh, <laughs> i don't know who, who writes that that's not having some thoughts mm -hmm. um and so i think that you know and then when you look at all these materials you just find more and more layers of queerness as you explore it um, yeah <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things that this really posits, the questions it posits is why horror and queerness are so sort of like intrinsically linked. Um, and we get a lot of different answers and a lot of different interpretations. I would love to know from you wh what your interpretation of that is, what you think that link is about. Well, growing up, queers, we're, we're seen as outsiders. We're seen, we don't fit in. We are even maybe told we're bad, told we're, you know, evil. We're going to hell. We're going to, you know, um, you know, the worst thing possible, you know, you're worse than a rapist, you know, like, it's just like, what are you talking about? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> but I think that's why we relate to horror so much because, you know, we, we feel like the monster and we see ourselves as the monster and we see ourselves on the screen. And we also see ourselves as, uh, you know, a survivor, you know, you, you, you see these stories and you're like, Oh, they survived. I can survive. This is mm -hmm. so cool. And I think, you know, for me, I like to push boundaries because I need to, because I was told I wasn't okay. So I have to push all the boundaries of what is the norm so that I can fit, have a life. If mm -hmm. I don't challenge, I don't get to have a life, you know? And I think that horror is a perfect place for that because horror is the challenge of cinema. You know, there, yeah. there horror is the place where we get to push boundaries in cinema so much oh, more than anyone I else. I love that. I think that's so great. And I like the idea of it being a survivor story because I do think that like the outsider element is certainly part of it, but um, there is a little bit of catharsis around being a survivor. I think Kevin William, uh, Williamson talked about that when he wrote Scream, that it was a queer survivor story, essentially, yeah. like metaphorically. So yeah, I love that. I love that so much. Um, yeah, it's so, funny. Uh, Scream it to me was one of the first kind of like, it, Chucky and Scream were the movies that I was like, wait a second, what's different about these movies? Why, <laughs> why do I like these so much more than the other horror movies? And, it, you know, at the time I had no idea that they were queer creators. I was just watching these movies and like, there's something very queer about these, but I can't even put my finger, you know, it's just there. <laughs> and I, and now it's really cool to get to go and explain that stuff. Hopefully, hopefully we will get another season and get to talk about those because we don't talk about the modern stuff in this one. And, um, but I do think, for this series, I think it's really important that everyone gets to see the, the beginnings, you know, yeah. uh, because that's the stuff that people don't know about, mm -hmm. you know, the modern stuff, we've figured it out <laughs> to a certain degree, but right. this older stuff, <clears throat> it's, it's really, and every person you talk to has a new thought or a new angle or a new position. Yeah. And so for us, I think when the show really came to life was when we, got to take this outline we made and 
started talking to people and yeah. the interviews, you know, one interview leads to another thing. And then you really realize how one topic relates to another. And, and then that's how it evolved into what it is now. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a huge horror fan and I learned so much from this. So, and I think yeah. it, it goes to this idea what you were saying about the amazing group of experts and interviewees that you have in this. It's really a spectacular group. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose them, how, and, and how that process worked? I think, well, I mean, we were lucky to have time on our, you know, to make this because I think it, you know, it started off smaller and kind of grew and grew and grew. And so I think, each round of interviews informed us about the next round. And so um, I, I think what we first did was, okay, Brian, who can you get to? Who can I get to? Who can everybody get to? You know, who, who how, you know, and we just started there and kept building. And then we wrote letters to agents and we wrote, you know, and then you'd, you'd get one person in and then they'd be like, oh, you know what? You should talk to this person. And so I think, um, it just evolved over time. And I think when, when I came in, I really was like, okay, hey, we're not talking to enough women. We're not talking enough to a, enough Butch Dykes. We need, and so we needed to, you know, expand that a little. And so I think that, um, you know, and I got Kim Pierce to come in and Angela Robinson to come in and I, you know, Gwen Turner to come in. And I think that um, this process has been so interesting because I really wanted to also talk to a very d diverse group of people. That was something right. that was also very important to us because so much of the content is made by white dudes, you know, because that's who got to make stuff at that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, we really wanted to make sure we had other perspectives. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to, you know, different identities, different genders, different, um, you know, ethnicities, you know, just every possible. And that's kind of what exploded this is that, you know, when you're talking about queer horror, there's, you know, so, so many broad and, yeah. and queerness mm -hmm. and so many. And I, I think for us, we're using horror in a very liberal term too. And we're talking about thriller on um, just anything that could be scary, really. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and um, I don't think everyone always expects it to be what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're like, oh, you're covering Hitchcock and, you know, and, and people say, well, Hitchcock wasn't gay. <sighs> well, Hitchcock himself may not have been gay, or we don't know about it if he was, but he worked with gay writers. He, or, mm -hmm. you know, and I usually like to use queer if you catch me, yeah. just say that. Queer writers, queer <laughs> actors, queer, you know, uh, and, and, and for him, I mean, my God, Rope, how can you even pretend that's not a queer movie? <laughs> right, right. I mean, the section on Psycho is so incredible. I love that you got Oz Perkins in there. And and all of that, I thought, was really, really powerful filmmaking and so fascinating, so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, I learned so much and I was surprised by so much that I thought I, I, thought I was an expert. And then I watched this and I was like, Ooh, I need to brush I mean, up a little bit. <laughs> we, we have learned. Our whole team is, you know, I can't believe that we kept getting challenged and we're like, Oh, really? Really? You know, I think so that, that was super fun because I feel like I've come out of this knowing so much more. Was and there anything so that you learned that surprised history. you? Yeah. You. Yeah. I mean, they're you so know, linked. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a specific example. Let's keep talking and it'll, it might filter okay. back into my brain. That sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> well, I know we're getting, we're getting in close to our time, although I could seriously talk to you for hours. So, so much fun. <laughs> um, beyond just kind of knowing more about the history of queer horror thrill and thriller genre and, and learning a little bit about the queer history uh, surrounding it. What do you hope the audiences take away from this documentary series that will hopefully get a sequel? <laughs> um, first, I'm going to go back to, I, yes. I didn't know about the letters. <laughs> I didn't know about the Bram Stoker letters to Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. and those Me letters neither. are revealing, you know, they're like, you're like, what on earth? What am I? You know, this guy is, you know, I read your letters with, you know, late at night with the door locked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I dare <laughs> not me. write it. I must say it in person. Yeah, it's exactly. It's like, throw this in the fire if you're not who I think you are. You know, <laughs> it's kind of, it's incredible, these, those letters. Um, so that was something for me that I did not know about. Um, and okay, so what do I want? So I want 
every queer person who doesn't have a community or a friend or knows that someone loves them to know that we're out here and we're here for you, find us. You know, you're not alone. You know, that's, that's what I want more than anything is like just for people to feel the acceptance and love they deserve. And yeah. I think that you can, that's what's cool about making a queer project is I can talk to so many people in my life and be myself and not be afraid to be me and have dyke tattooed on the back of my neck. And you know what I mean? I can do <laughs> things like this. Yeah. But when you make a movie or a show, it can talk to so many more people. And so I hope that, you know, it, as well, I hope that, you know, it kind of lights a fire and maybe it pisses people off and gets people <laughs> aggravated. And also I hope it inspires queers to remember that we have to keep fighting for our rights. They're not gone. Right. If we don't keep fighting, we, you know, we'll lose things. Yeah. And it's, and we are in danger now. And I feel like I spent, you know, the nineties pushing boundaries and fighting. Right. And now it's like, it, it just feels scary. It's like, wait a second. I thought, I mean, you know, I call it the Obama we're backsliding. Lull. Yeah. We had the Obama lull and we we're like, yeah, yeah, everything's different. Yeah. <laughs> we had the horrifying black backsliding experience and what comes after that. Yeah. Um, and I think it, myself, I was quite like, oh, I got my life. I'm complacent. I don't need to do any of this anymore. And the show really brought me back around to like, I've got to do something. This is not okay. You know, mm -hmm. we live in our bubbles in the cities. We don't under, we don't remember what happened back in that time. And we have to remember that there are people out there that still need our help. And yeah. hopefully yeah. They, they find it and leave those shitty places. <laughs> <laughs> There's room, Get come. Out. Yeah, I think <laughs> those those there are a handful of clips, like old like newsreel clips or some kind of and it was kind of terrifying. Uh, how similar the rhetoric in those were like either meant to be outdated uh, aesthetically they're outdated yeah but the messages but, are just as relevant today well it's cyclical right you know like yeah. it's it's kind of how the the 20s were wild <laughs> and you had the haze code and up to the 50s which is and then it's and then the 60s started opening up again mm -hmm. and for I think for queers, the '90s was a huge like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but then I think the kids coming up in the 2000s were like, well, I felt cyberbullied. I felt they had a different kind of bullying, and mm -hmm. I think you know the generations before them were like, let's, we did it. We're getting gay marriage. We're, we pushed through. We're even though we didn't get that till many years later. Whatever we're getting, but you know, I mean, I think in the '90s you had no choice, right? Because your friends right. are dying of AIDS you had to do something or you just right. felt like an idiot <laughs> because you know you the level of death and dying for you know in your 20s to experience that is horrific and right. I, I for me it was a nightmare you know and i feel like but it did it politicized everybody mm -hmm. and i think that um it's terrible that that's what it took or that's right. what was happening, but it did make you really, like I said, fight, fight the power. <laughs> yeah. I do love the idea that this documentary will help radicalize some people because we need to get radical right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I, that's what I, yeah, exactly. And I stole that from Nay. Nay is really the one who's been like our, one of our co-producers. She's been like, you know, let's, let's radicalize. <laughs> yeah. Let's radicalize. And everybody watch queer for fear because it is amazing. Thank exactly. you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I am being so generous with your time. I know we ran over, but it was fun. Oh, that's fine. I'm, 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 I don't, I'm a chatter. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this was great. Thank you so, so much for your time. I really, really do appreciate it. And I, I oh, cannot, yeah. I can't wait to hear about the next season that I think will definitely come because if people watch this, they're going to be obsessed. I know cool. I am. Awesome. I so. Thanks everybody. Thank I you. really appreciate this. If you enjoyed our interviews today, be sure to subscribe to Pride's YouTube channel and visit us at pride.com.